the book is um, Ordinary Stories in an Extraordinary World. Uh, it's written by Akila Thio, and she's writing as a, a sister of an autistic brother. So she has a younger brother who she calls Jan in the book, um, and she's sort of like, uh, I'm going to read a few incidents from the book um, regarding her experience. Okay, so, um, all right. Jan is the brother. Um, Jan used to have the fiercest tantrums when he was about four, right up till he was eight or so. In that mood, he was like an unstoppable force of nature. If you tied a watering hose to him and let him loose, you could have watered an entire plantation in record time. One of the most trying aspects was his interest in little else but running around. Trying to calm him down or hold him back during a tantrum was akin to taming a squall. I remember back when my mother was much stronger health-wise, she would bring Jan to the market after seeing me off to school, as there was no one at home to mind him. Jan usually behaved himself fairly well when it came to these outings. He liked going out and riding the public transport. During one of these outings, an incident occurred that left an indelible mark on our memories. My mother and Jan had taken a taxi to a small mart. When they arrived, the mart was still a few minutes from its appointed opening time. Jan, however, was thrilled at the sight of the mart and tried to get in. He and my mother stopped by the mart folks. Well, were stopped by the mart folks. They said they would open at the time when they were supposed to open, and not a minute earlier, nor a minute later. Can't you make an exception just this once, my mother asked them, as Jan began to cry. He's a special needs child. What difference will three or four minutes make? They said it was that policy, and that was that. My mother asked to speak with their supervisor or whoever was in charge. It turned out she was already talking to them. Three-year-old Jan then went into a full-fledged tantrum. My mother managed to carry him, a, scream a screaming bundle of flailing arms and legs, some distance away from the entrance, whereupon he threw himself on the ground and cried and shrieked and rolled until he was thoroughly red in the face. Then he cried some more till he turned a little blue. The mart people went about their business as if nothing noteworthy was happening. It was none of their business and policy stood on their side. Some folks passing by stopped to help my mother. A few of them marched up to the smart, to the mud people and demanded that my mother and brother be let in. However, they too lost to policy. By the time the mud did finally open, not a minute earlier nor a minute later than it was supposed to, my brother had cried himself sick and my mother had to bring him home. Sometimes it's not a matter of whether a person can or cannot help. It is a matter of whether they choose to. The mini mud staff chose not to. My mother was not the only person who left the place disgusted. So were the other people who had stopped to help her. That mud lost more than a few customers that morning. On the bright side, this is proof that not all our countrymen and women are cold, standoffish, and unhelpful as are often portrayed. My family will always remember that there are indeed lovely people around who would help a mother in need. Okay, um, I'm going to read the next passage, which. Um, So what's happening here is that um, Jen, the autistic brother, um, had been throwing items out of the HDB flat window that he lived in and um, had been arrested by the police officers and forcibly removed, um, even though they had explained that he's a special needs child. Okay, so um, my brother and I were put in a kind of holding cell in the hospital where we waited with uh, a number of officers. Some of them were nice enough. Noticing that Jan's lips were chapped and blue, they offered to get him drinks and asked if he was hungry. Then Jan was brought to see the doctors. Once they were done, they were transported to the police station. I soon discovered to my consternation that they meant to lock Jan up in a cell overnight. So I marched right up to the officers and demanded to see their superior. I was referred to the inspector who had taken charge of the case. When I met him at his desk, he seemed unwilling to talk and somewhat helpless. So I demanded to see his superior. You must have thought I was such a charming and sociable person when I made all these demands. I would have been prepared to meet nasty, stomping, furry ogres if it meant I could bring Jan home. This officer had been too peeved to take note of his exact rank, but its title had a superintendent someplace. It was an aloof, 
thorny faced man with a subtle sneer about his mouth and a dismissive look in his eye. Perhaps he saw a naive little girl who meant to tell him sentimental stories to try and convince him that her brother was not a criminal. He was right. He began to talk about how my brother had committed an offence, how it was all standard procedure, how they could make no exceptions, and so on. I simply looked at him. I was not angry, nor was I sad. I was only determined. Jan does not conform to your policies nor standard procedure, I said. <laughs> Maybe if you stop a moment to think about what you're doing, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. Jan's upset now and he's ill. He's never go gone to bed not surrounded by his family. If you put him in that cell overnight alone, not only will you be doing something cruel, you will also be doing something counterproductive because that would just make him even more upset. And when you give him back to us very upset, do you think good things will happen? You'll be dealing him emotional and psychological damage. What's more, he's an autistic boy. Who knows what this damage will do to him or how he will react. You'll be dealing my, fa my family further damage. Don't you think that enough damage has already been done? He paused, then tried, tried to sound out anything that seemed like a loophole in my argument, searching for weak links. I kept right on talking. I was not letting my brother become a prisoner. Finally, his expression softened and he heaved a sigh. For a moment, he looked weary. Under that stiff, jaded, condescending exterior roughened by years of life and work, he was really a reasonable man. He relented and made a couple of phone calls. I was then told that my brother would be released on the condition that the Institute of Mental Health, or IMH, take a look at him if he was unwell. <coughs> the police transferred the case to the IMH, and there Jen underwent a thorough exa examination. The doctors found anomalies in his liver and that his blood pressure was too high and his pulse abnormal. I must have thanked him, that officer whose rank I cannot remember. I cannot recall how. Now, if I had, I do not think I had thanked him as an officer, but as a person and a human being. And so Jen came home. Okay. Yeah? So this is just one last reading. Um, Um, national service. Almost every male denizen in our fair land has to undergo this rite of passage. Local literature, media and coffee shop repertoires have all had a hand in welding it into the foundation of our culture. Indeed, it has a subculture of its own. No one with a Singaporean identity of any kind is unfamiliar with its folkways. Since, still, I was um, surprised when my brother got the summons a few months short of his 18th birthday. The family was at home one afternoon and my father handed me the letter and my brother's documents. He asked if I could do him a favor and call up the relevant people as he was busy. For a fleeting moment, I envisaged my brother enlisting. It could end in no other way than him bossing his sergeant ar around. I could either be annoyed or amused at the fact that my brother had gotten the summons at all. At that point, I was much more inclined to see it in a comedic light. So I carried on entertaining the waggish idea. We would have to remind the officers to seal, lock, or install drills on all the windows. They would have to take special care to keep their keys with them wherever they go, because my, my brother had a talent for making keys vanish. He also had a knack of locking the doors involved before he does, um, so that my, mother, my family is constantly replacing doorknobs in the household. It becomes something of a regular monthly expense. Oh, and they would too have to be informed that he prefers eating with a pair of kitchen scissors and a fork. Just imagine. Oh, also, Mr. Officer Person, sir, we think you had better mind his toiletry. He has a couple of squeezing whole bottles and tubes of soap and soup toothpaste down the drain for the heck of it. He might want to rethink putting a rifle in his hands. He will accept it very happily, of course. He would not have any trouble dismantling it either, but with his experience in dismantling a lot of things at home, he would probably follow up by dismantling the rest of the company's rifles. <laughs> Last but not least, we do not want him back at the. We do want him back at the end of his service. You see, everyone who has minded him in his life has always grown so attached to him. They wanted to bring him home and teared because they missed him. You probably would too, but we can't let you have him just the same. My father's voice brought my attention back to the letter. Do they really want him? I asked, amused. He would get more exercise that way. Why don't you call them and see? Joke that, setting the documents down on my desk. Wouldn't they have his record? I asked, feeling slightly incredulous as I looked at the letter. 
I suppose they can't check each and every person's record, my father said. Oh, can't they? I responded, drawing out a pen as my father explained whom to contact. Okay, leave it to me, I'll settle it, I said, sorting the documents in order. My father thanked me and left to study. My family has done this many times, making calls and visits to explain, oh, no, he can't, or no, he won't, and this is why. I used to loathe it, but as time passed, I suppose I got used to the business. Getting used to it does not make it fun, though, and so when I picked up the phone, I knew that I was once again in for it. There was, a, there was ringing and a click and then a man's voice. Yes, hello, I said. It's this. My brother has been giving no, given notice to turn up for the national service and... How old is your brother? The man interrupted. He's 17, I said. And he has been called down to register this coming June, he continued. <coughs> yes, but you see... Then that's good, that's right. Yes, but you see, the thing is, he's autistic. He won't be able to attend national service. We'd like to find out how we're supposed to go about having him exempted. What? What? No, there's no such thing. That's impossible. Everyone has to attend national service. There's no excuse. I had to pause for a few moments before speaking into the receiver again. My brother is autistic, I said emphatically. He can't attend NS unless you'd like to have it. Do you know what autism is? Autism? Is he sick? He can only be exempt if he's sick. How long has he been autistic for? He inquired as if I had told him that my brother had just caught the flu. For as long as he can remember, I said. I beg your pardon, I said he was autistic, not sick. He's not sick. He's not sick, I affirm. He has autism. It's a condition. He won't be able to do NS. Has he been checked by our doctors? You need to have him certify him unfit for NS, said the person. <laughs> if they say officially that he can't be able to do NS, only then can he be excused. Alright, I said, playing along. How do we get the doctors to certify he's autistic and so unfit for NS? Don't you have a medical appointment? You need to have a medical appointment. You need to bring him down to this address and let the doctors check him very thoroughly to make sure he's autistic, said the person. <laughs> I was tempted to say, don't worry, I don't think he's faking it. Instead, I said, we don't have an appointment. You need to speak to another person to arrange it, he said. I'll have that person call you back. Yes, do that please, thank you. And then I hung up the phone and took a lot of deep breaths. It was a good fortune that the next call was from a nice, sensible lady who understood the situation in two sentences. She said that all we had to do was send them a letter from Jan's old school stating that he was once a student there and that was it. I thanked her and put down the phone. I suppose I was not going to have to remind the army officers in charge to secure Jan's barrack door after lights out in case he woke up in the middle of the night and decided he wanted to like he would like to go on an adventure. When the comedy wanes, however, I find myself always wishing to raise the level of autism awareness in Singapore to a whole new level.